Dear Lord, I just ask that you would be with me now. Lord, I pray especially for an extra dose of your Holy Spirit as we try to cover much material. Uh, Lord, I pray that everyone here will be blessed. May your Holy Spirit be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, the, um, the title of this presentation and this segment of the presentation I call Nothing New Under the Sun. And um, I have here Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. It says this, The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. How many of you know why we chose the name Meet It for this conference? How many of you could just preach a sermon on that? I wish more hands went up, but that's the purpose of what I'm going to be talking about right now. And it boils down to this. The Adventist church has dealt with all of these issues once before, and the likes of Dr. Kellogg. And so I'm going to take a look at some of these things. Um, but let's just kind of ease into it. Um, Ellen White says, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way has, the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Now, as a review, I just want you to remember some of the things we talked about last night. And I know some of you may not have been here last night. So I'm just going to hit a couple of the high points. Um, Moltmann was one of the theologians of the Emergent Church Movement. And he talked about atheism and Christianity in conflict with each other. But he says they don't have to be in conflict with each other. They can also work together. And he went on to say, which of them, Christianity or atheism, will prove to be stronger in the long run is something we may confidently leave to the future. We also uh, talked about Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, and he had this concept of the cosmic Christ. This cosmic body of Christ extends throughout the universe and comprises all things that attain their fulfillment in Christ so that the body of Christ is the one single thing that is being made in creation. This is very much in line with emergent church theology. And then we had the Buddhist, uh, Ken Wilber, and he had this statement that I'd like to remind you of. All the mystics, in, he says, are the mystics and sages insane? Because they all tell variations of the same story, don't they? Maybe, just maybe, an individual's consciousness does indeed touch infinity, a total embrace of the entire cosmos, a cosmic consciousness that is spirit awakened in its own tr true nature. It's at least plausible. Now, it's interesting what he said there because he's really echoing Solomon, saying there's nothing new under the sun. And within this paganism, they're right. And finally, we looked at uh, McLaren. Um, McLaren is one of the emergent church leaders. He's one that's popular um, within certain segments of the Seventh-day Adventist church. He's not an Adventist. Um, and I wanted to read again and put this in your mind, what he had to say. The way he described this is pure pantheism. He said this in, in his book, A Generous Orthodoxy. I felt that every tree, every blade of grass, and every pool of water become especially eloquent with God's grandeur. Somehow they seemed to become transparent, or perhaps translucent is a better word, because each thing in its particularity was still utterly visible and unspeakably important. These specific concrete things became translucent in the sense that a powerful, indescribable, invisible light seemed to shine through. It was the exuberant joy of simply seeing these masterpieces of God's creation and knowing myself to be among them. I was to be one of them and to feel and know that we, all of these creatures, molecules, and phenomena, were together known and loved by God who embrace us all in the ultimate capital W, we. This is pure pantheism and this is what we find inside the emergent church movement. Now, with that review, let's go on to something new. Something new, but something old. John Harvey Kellogg and the Alpha of Apostasy. Ellen White, talking about uh, Kellogg, said this, 
Be not deceived, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us, in John Harvey Kellogg, the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. Now, talking about alphas and omegas, um, I think of this as kind of like a train. You have the first car, that's the alpha, and you have the last car, that's the omega. It's all a train, and we'll be looking for something that is very, very similar. Another train car on that same train. So let's briefly go through Kellogg's life. Um, oh, I used to have his date of birth memorized. But anyway, he was a young boy. Um, he was dedicated to the Lord. It's a very interesting story about his dedication to the Lord. He, um, he, um, he swore he wouldn't be a doctor. That was after he had seen one of his playmates uh, break his leg and the doctor had to reset it. And it's kind of old school, you know, um, doing this. And it was kind of a barbaric thing. And he swore he wouldn't do that. But his mother sat him down and prayed over him and dedicated him to the Lord right on the spot. And he said after that, he was always dedicated to doing the Lord's work and somehow helping his fellow men. Well, Kellogg's story is tied up with Ellen White's um, story. And so let's look at 1855. I'm going to move through this timeline rather quickly. In 1855, James and Ellen White relocate to Battle Creek. This is the first time they really kind of settle down. Before that, they're kind of itinerant, itinerant preachers. And James starts the steam press. 1856, the Kellogg's move to Battle Creek, and they start a broom factory. Now, there's a whole bunch of them. I think there was like 14 in the family or something like that. And so I found a picture with a whole bunch of people in a broom factory. That's not the Kellogg's, but I think that might be what it looked like. <laughs> 1864, John Harvey Kellogg goes to work at the steam press. And while he was working there, he was known as someone who liked to read everything that they had in the steam press, everything that they printed. 1866, the Whites start the Western Health Reform Institute. 1869 to 1872, Kellogg attends normal school. Now, normal school is one of those old words for a school where we teach people to be teachers. So he was planning on becoming a teacher. Remember, he wasn't planning on being a doctor. While he was there, he was inspired by the works of a social reformer, Margaret Fuller. Now, remember, as we looked last night, that we saw that a lot of the emergents are very much in mind and aligned with social reform. And here we have a Margaret Fuller. She was kind of involved in some weird spiritual movements, and uh, she's also very much a social reformer and very inspirational to John Harvey Kellogg. In 1872 to 1875, John Harvey Kellogg went to medical school. Why did he go to medical school? Well, you remember the Whites started the Western Health Reform Institute, and his older brother was working there. And at the same time, they realized they need another doctor. And they thought, you know, the young John Harvey Kellogg showed a lot of promise. And Ellen White went to him and asked him to go to medical school. And so he went back on what his decision had been earlier in life and changed his mind and followed the leading of the Lord and went to medical school. Well, <clears throat> we know ultimately that John Harvey Kellogg apostatized, but it didn't happen just overnight. And so I'd like to, to, to kind of lay some of the, the background for that. So um, looking at General Conference in 1874, um, whereas the impression has gone out from some unknown cause that Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, M.D., holds infinite, infidel sentiments. So by 1874, there's questions being arise about his sentiments. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, pass through this, and we'll just know that the question was arisen as early as that date. 1872 to 1876. I think this is interesting, and I think this may explain uh, John Harvey Kellogg to some extent, um, at least a little bit about his life. Uh, during that time frame, he courted a Mary Kelsey. However, something happened 
in 1876. 1876, Mary Kelsey married Willie White. That changed Kellogg's relationship with the White family. Um, I think that there was a real attempt to downplay that and not make it a big deal, but it had to have hurt. In 1876, the same year, Kellogg was made superintendent of the Western Health Reform Institute. So the plan had gone through just as planned. He'd become a doctor, became well-trained. He became the, the leader of the Western Health Reform Institute. And immediately, he changed the name to Battle Creek Sanitarium. Now, prior to this time, no one had ever used the word sanitarium. And so he came up with this word. And um, it's become a common word now. Now, <laughs> a little quiz. Do you recognize these famous guys? They all went to Battle Creek. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, oh boy, President Taft, and Harding. They all went to Battle Creek. This was the place to go. And just a little trivia, who was President Harding married to? I don't remember her name, but she was a Seventh-day Adventist. 1876, he writes a letter to Ellen White, and he says this, I know I have not that communion with Christ in the fullness of the, dis of the divine spirit and influence that an active Christian ought to have. I know nothing of the emotional part of religion. I have theoretical faith, but I am such a doubting, suspicious nature that I cannot make a practical application of it. Kellogg was in trouble. He said this uh, as he was um, reminiscing about his life. This was uh, written much later uh, when someone was interviewing him. He said this, I was trying to believe in God and nature. I had two gods, but I could not go on thus. I could not see how God could be above nature. So I had taken the position that God was not above nature. I believed that nature was almost equal with God. Um, he was influenced by Ernest Haeckel. Um, Haeckel is uh, uh, famous for um, showing how, it, allegedly, how embryos develop and go through an evolutionary process as they develop. That was later debunked, and he was put on trial at the University of Jenning. And um, yet we still see it in our textbooks today. 1879, Kellogg marries Ella Eaton, and he adopts 42 children. You know, there might be a lesson in this, too, and that moderation might be best. <laughs> um, the interesting thing about this, though, is that when Kellogg announced his wedding, people went to the wedding wondering who he was going to marry. So this was a very different kind of a, of a romance. Well, this all happened in Battle Creek, and I think it's really important to understand what's going on in Battle Creek and who the Battle Creek churches are. Um, you have Hicksite Quakers, Universalists, Swedenborgians, Progressionists, and Spiritualists, and they all worship together. So <laughs> what's going on here? Um, I think that this is somewhat representative of the age and not just in Battle Creek. So the Hicksite Quakers, um, this is a branch of Quakerism. Quakers were founded by George Fox. And um, what you have to understand about the Quakers is there was a time in America where the Quakers the Quakers were persecuted. And the reason why they were persecuted is because they weren't thought to be Christian. And for a while, the Quakers wouldn't, if you asked a Quaker, they wouldn't even say that they were Christian. But because of persecution being what it is and some changes in the faith, most of them will now tell you that they're Christian today if you were to ask. Um, there's evangelical Quakers. There's Hicksite Quakers. The Hicksite Quakers are more of the traditional, less, uh, less Christian Quaker. One of the things that's really important about Quakerism is that they believe that you have something in you that's divine that you have to follow. And so you have an inner guide rather than relying on a strict reading of the scriptures. Remember George Fox's name, the founder. But then there's this guy who I find very, very interesting. His name is John Martin Peebles. He was born March of 1822 and, and died in 1922, so he lived a long time. He's a physician, an author, a health reformer, a universalist, a spiritualist, a theophysist, 
president of the National Spiritual Association and pastor of the independent congregation in Battle Creek, Michigan. So he's right there in Battle Creek. He's a contemporary of John Harvey Kellogg. And by the way, he wrote a book in the 1990s. If you would like to read it, I don't suggest that you do, you can. Now you say, how did he write a book so recently? Well, it was channeled. It was a channeled book. The other thing about him that's sort of interesting is his books, you can get them all on Amazon. They'll reprint them for you. I think they're print on demand to some extent, but uh, you can get them. Listen to what he has to say. He says, I've seen tables, books, and other materials move without physical content. Also, tambourines, violins, and guitars sail rapidly around a room by some unseen power, discoursing all the time delightful melodies. Don't let anyone tell you Disney is just fun and games. If you know Disney, that's a scene out of Disney. But far before Disney, he says, I've heard the voice of my Indian friend Pahatan and other spirit voices as distinctly as I've heard the human, have seen the spirit form, grasped the spirit hand, felt the gentle spirit touch, and feasted upon the most enchanting spirit music when there was no individual in the earth form near me. Listen to this next thing, and remember what we had with Teilhard de Chardin and Brian McLaren and, and these other folks that we've talked about before. He says this. He's talking about spiritualism, and he talks about this. Waves of progress moving in cycles continually overlap. While many spirit ripples have danced upon the sea of progress, three mighty waves have loomed up on the ocean of the ages, ancient, medieval, and modern spiritualism. Now think about what we've talked about with the emergent church, and we'll talk about more of this stuff as we go. But he sees these three things. He goes on to describe in the, in the chapter, he talks about the ancient, and he looks to India, Egypt, and China. Then he talks about the medieval, and he looks to Greece, Rome, and the early Christian church. Remember that, because in the emergent church, we have ancient future. And then modern, of course, he attributes to uh, spiritualism of his day. But he sees this progress, and this, he talks constantly about progress and progressing from the ancient to the medieval to the modern. It's the same kind of progress like we saw with the great chain of being. He had this to say. He thought that it was an absurd notion that man is a personal being standing, or, you know, you know I edited this slide last night, and I made a mistake. He, had this search, uh, he says that it's an absurd church notion that God, not man, God, is a personal being standing outside the universe. And he uses this example, much as a child rolls a hoop. He says this, spiritualism endorses the idea of an infinite father, our father living through all grades of existence. And what he's talking about there is everything like pantheism. He says man is the highest earth manifestation of the father. God within kind of talk. Imputed righteousness, atonements, and special schemes of salvation are priestly dodges to sustain the craft. You know, we have witchcraft, that means falsehood, the falsehood, and secure the salary. This guy does not like Christian doctrine. He says this, cultured and spiritually enlightened, the more advanced consider heaven not so much a world in the starry firmament as the inner state of the soul. It sounds like Brian McLaren, right, that we just heard. He says this, honor thy inner Christhood, live the divine life. Spiritualism seeks to demolish sectarian bar barriers. So what's going on here? Well, if you start to study this too much, you'll start to realize that there's pantheism. That's the belief that God is in everything. And then there's a subgroup of pantheism which is panentheism. And this is taking the idea, remember the Hegelian dialectic of putting pantheism and monotheism together, that gives you panentheism. And if you really look at this, I just put this in here because some of you will run across this if you study into this. This is a, co a term coined in 1928 by a German mystic philosopher, Karl Krauss, popularized in the 20th century. So don't fault anyone for calling what we're really looking at pantheism when some people will call it panentheism today because this is modern terminology. But panentheism is a belief system which posits that the divine in 
scepter penetrates every part of the universe. God is viewed as the soul of the universe, the universal spirit present everywhere in everything and everyone at all times. It's slightly more personal than the old school pantheism where God is everything, everything is God, and it's just a big fat equal sign between everything and God. Um, 1897, uh, John Harvey Kellogg says this to the General Conference, the same divinity that was in us and is seeking to lead us to the same perfection which we see in Christ, to the attainment of which there can be no hindrance except our in individual wills. He's starting to talk a little bit more like um, towards the pantheism. In 1897, he said this, those who meet the Lord when, the, when he comes, oh, this is, this is interesting. I forgot this slide was coming out. I was just reading it to, to remind myself. Look, his gospel started to change. He said, those who meet the Lord when he comes will be above the power of disease as well as above the power of sin. They will reach this condition by obedience to truth. So he's taking now the health message and elevating it up into something even higher. And I just put this in here as a sideline because A.T. Jones went down that exact same path in the interest of time, I'm just going to move through it. And Wagoner went down the same path. Very, very interesting. So, in the interest of time, moving on to 1899, there's a William Spicer, missionary to India. Man, what a strong Christian and an amazing guy. And he writes a great little story about this. He, he, I wouldn't say story, a history um, he says this, when the peril arose and was recognized as the very thing against which the warnings had been uttered, we realized that truly the word of the Lord had been fulfilled again as of old. Before it came to pass, I showed it to thee. He's talking about the spirit of prophecy and how the spirit of prophecy, how Ellen White was writing to protect the church about these things. I just don't have time to read all these, but she talks about how Christ came as a personal savior. He's a personal God. She says this, the idolatry of nature is a farce. It's an invention of men who know not God. In 1901, John Harvey Kellogg at General Conference said this, take the sunflower, for example. It looks straight at the sun. It watches and follows the sun all day long, looking straight at it all the time. And as the sun dips down below the horizon, you see that sunflower still looking at it. And as the sun turns round and comes up in the morning, the flower is looking toward the sun rising. It is God in the sunflower that makes it do this. Oh, my. He said this, the whole sanctuary question is the question of our bodies and of ourselves personally and not a question of architecture. Remember, he's taking and elevating the health message to be the gospel. And in the same process, he's replacing the sanctuary doctrine with the health message this way. Well, Battle Creek Fire, uh, 1902, the sanitarium burned down to the ground. Almost immediately, John Harvey Kellogg started writing The Living Temple. He had a plan. His plan was to write this book and sell it and use it to raise funds to build a new Battle Creek sanitarium. Um, drafted in 1902, almost immediately published in 1903. Spicer had this to say about it. He says, there's something supernatural in the working of this thing. We who first came in contact with the real inwardness of the teaching at close quarters had felt that power working in this philosophy. He's talking about Kellogg's philosophy here. Friends of the teaching smiled at the idea that there was anything mysterious in it. For myself, I knew there was mystic hypnotic power in it. I knew by painful experience that I had to fight it, resist it in my soul, or I would be swept off my feet. And I never got free from that paralyzing fear of it and challenge of it in face-to-face -face committee work. Yet some smiled at the idea of the danger. Now, Ellen White cautions against us reading um, the Living Temple, and she cautions against us reading works of spiritualist authors. And we need to be careful 
Um, I haven't read it, but I did kind of scan through it to try to figure out what was in it. And I'm going to give you just a couple little snippets so that you can understand what's there. Here's an excerpt from it. Animal life and vegetable life are not merely kindred lives, but really are one and the same. Every leaf, every blade of grass, every flower, every bird, even every insect, as well as every beast or every tree, bears witness to the infinite versatility and inexhaustible resources of the one all-pervading, all-creating, all-sustaining, capital L, life. It's the same stuff. There's nothing new under the sun. It's the same thing that we've seen from the emergent authors. It says, God is the explanation of nature, not a God outside of nature, but in nature, a tree maker in a tree, a flower maker in a flower. There's all around us an infinite, divine, though invisible presence. Remember how the emergents say we're recreating the world with God? He says this, God actually entered into the product of his creative skill, that's man, so that it might not only outwardly reflect the divine conception, but that it might think divinely and act divinely. We're starting to see the God within. God not only forms a man from the dust of the ground, but continues to form him as long as he lives. And the moment the creative process ceases, the walls of the temple totter and fall, its timbers fall apart, and the whole edifice crumbles back to dust. Pantheism, God within. Spicer gives this uh, uh, account of the conversation with Kellogg. He says, where is God? I was asked by Kellogg. I would naturally say he is in heaven. There the Bible pictures the throne of God. All the heavenly beings at his command as messengers between heaven and earth. But I was told that God was in the grass and the plants and in the trees with motions to the grass and the trees about us as we sat on the open veranda. Remember what people said about sophisticated people thinking about where heaven is? Right? <laughs> Kellogg is saying the same thing. There is no heaven. You're seeing it here. God is here. He's here with us. Where is, <clears throat> where is heaven, I asked. I think this is a repeat. Let's keep going. He goes on to say this. Uh, Spicer says, there was no place in this scheme of things for angels going to between heaven and earth, for heaven was here and everywhere. Remember that talk about God's dreams and desires being realized? I'm going to keep going on. By any understanding I had of language, I was listening to the ideas of pantheistic philosophy that I had met with in India. Spicer knew what he was looking at because he had been a missionary to India. In fact, I was told that pure pantheism, as the early teachers conceived it, was indeed right. God was in the things of nature. With scripture terms and Christian ideas interwoven, it seemed that the old doctrine of the Hindus, all nature a very part of Brahma, and Brahma the whole. In 1902, um, the, the, uh, there was a committee report um, about, the, uh, about the living temple, and um, they said that they should, uh, that they should uh, circulate it. Um, however, Spirit of Prophecy said no. And so as they were getting ready to, um, to print it, there was a fire, and the Review and Herald burned. And so the book wasn't printed for some time. I'm going to pass through um, some of these uh, slides here because we just don't have time. It's very interesting, though. They moved General Conference headquarters just to get away from the influence of Kellogg. And by God's grace, it worked. Amen. Today, you can't do that nearly as easily because of the way the Internet works. So, meet it. Autumn Council, 1903. And this is where we get the name for this conference. Autumn Council. Ellen White says this. One night, a scene was clearly presented before me. A vessel was upon the waters in a heavy fog. Suddenly, the lookout cried, Iceberg just ahead. There, towering high above the ship, was a gigantic iceberg. An authoritative voice, voice cried out, Meet it. There was not a moment's hesitation. It was time for instant action. The engineer put on full steam, and the man at the wheel steered the ship straight into the iceberg. With a crash, she struck the ice. The goal of this is to go ahead and hit it hard and try to break it so that it won't break the ship. 
There was a fearful shock, and the iceberg broke into many pieces, falling with a noise like thunder to the deck. The passengers were violently shaken by the force of the collision, but no lives were lost. The vessel was injured, but not beyond repair. She rebounded from the contact, trembling from stem to stern like a living creature. Then she moved forward on her way. Well, I knew the meaning of this representation. I had my orders. I heard the words, like a voice from our captain, meet it. I knew what my duty was and that there was not a moment to lose. The time for decided action had come. I must, without delay, obey the command, meet it. She went on to say this, Living temple contains the alpha of those theories. I knew that the omega would follow in a little while, and I trembled for our people. And so because of this, our church took action, and it went to meet the apostasy of John Harvey Kellogg. She goes on to say, We make of no effect the truth of heavenly origin and rob the people of God by their past experience, giving them instead a false science. We are God's commandment-keeping people. For the past 50 years, every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us to becloud our minds regarding the teaching of the word, especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and the message of heaven for these last days as given by the angels of the 14th chapter of Revelation. Messages of every order and kind have been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of the truth, which point by point has been sought out by prayerful study and testified to by the miracle working power of the Lord. But the way marks which have made us what we are are to be preserved, and they will be preserved, as God has signified through his word and the testimony of his spirit. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. So what happened to the book, The Living Temple. Well, Kellogg wasn't able to sell it amongst Adventists. And so the Herald of the Golden Age, Spicer was on his way back to India, and he saw this while he was in London. This is a magazine from a spiritualist organization, somewhat similar to a Masonic organization, and guess what? They were selling it. And if you go to the Heritage Room in Loma Linda, they have a copy that these guys sold, and you can tell because they they put their sticker in the front cover, and it's there. And so they sold it for some time, and you can find this on the internet. 1907, um, Kellogg was disfellowshipped. And I'm going to skip ahead here. She talks about Kellogg presenting his ideas and how twisted it twisted the minds of his listener. I want to just finish here with Pebbles. Peebles. In 1908, Kellogg had a party at the Battle Creek. And I don't know how much weight to put to this. I really just don't know. But what I do know is that Peebles is representative of the age, and he seems to be representative of the ideas of John Harvey Kellogg. And Peebles was invited at this party to give a tribute to Dr. Kellogg in 1908. And Peebles told how he remembered in 19, excuse me, 1856 meeting the bright, sturdy, active, wide-awake boy playing in the streets. They were friends. There's nothing new under the sun. What's happened before will happen 